All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. So I welcome, first of all, I, I welcome Professor Betty, who despite his busy schedule, find, found time for our institute lecture. And I also welcome the listeners uh, and viewers joining through WebEx, as well as those who are watching it uh, on our live stream on YouTube. So, uh, so just to give you some context on our institute lecture. So as uh, many of us know, Google Scholar says, uh, standing on the cho shoulder of joints. So that's our philosophy at IIT Jodhpur as well, where we invite, regularly invite uh, eminent researchers and academicians uh, from across the group uh, to learn from them and uh, to take our research forward. So in this uh, uh, sequence, uh, today we have uh, Professor Michael Betty from UCL. So uh, first, I would like to invite our director, uh, Professor Shantanu Chaudhary, uh, for open. Thank you, uh, Deepak. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are very clearly. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me formally welcome Professor Batty again to this, uh, this uh, institute lecture. And institute lecture is, as Deepak has pointed out, is, uh, is a special lecture where we invite the dwens of the field to know more about the work which is happening in that particular area. And the emerging areas are what we are looking at. Today's talk has specific significance with respect to what India and Indian government is thinking about the urban development. Urbanization is happening across the globe, and India is in many cases no exception. And, uh, and the urban centers are becoming bigger. Even new urban centers are coming up. And the current initiative is in terms of thinking about how the cities would be, say, 25 years down the line when independent India will reach 100. So therefore, the cities at 2047 is a major initiative in the country right now. And obviously, if we have to look at that initiative, we really need to visualize, imagine, and understand the complexity of urban growth. And with this objective, we have also created a research group at IIT Jodhpur on futures of cities. And this talk is primarily being hosted with interest and support from the research group on futures of cities. And to really to talk about complexity and the new science of cities, uh, we would not have got a better person than Professor Michael Batty. And we are all excited to know more about these whole processes, complexities, and the way we are also trying to look at it in terms of a dynamical system, the city's growth, city, how the city behaves, and how can it be modeled like a dynamical systems, and can a predictive, predictive aspect can be integrated into dynamical system? These are some of the questions I think IIT Jodhpur faculty are engaged with, and this talk will give us more insight and better understanding of the whole process itself. With these few words, I I, uh, I would hand it over to Deepak to take the proceedings forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Chaudhary. So uh, now uh, I would like to uh, first uh, introduce uh, our esteemed speaker. So uh, Professor Betty, uh, he, he is working in the area of, of cities and com complexities since uh, 70s, so roughly around the time complexity theory was being adopted uh, across uh, various disciplines. So, so and uh, from from that background, his first book for which he also uh, won the award uh, that was Cities and Complexity, published by MIT Pre Press, 2005, and he for which he won uh, Alonso Prize for Regional Science Association uh, in 2010. And then uh, he he. he his more recent work are the new science of cities, again from 
MIT Press and an edited volume on virtual geographic environments uh, published by Isri Press. Press. And uh, currently uh, he is the Bartlett Professor of Planning at UCL and where he is also Chair of Center for Advanced Special Analysis and also a Turing Fellow in the Allen Turing Institute. So uh, more recent volume, Urban Informatics, which is published by uh, Springer in year 2021. It reflects his focus on the application of digital technologies to urban planning. He's also a fellow of the British Academy uh, and the Royal Society. And he was uh, awarded the CBE in Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2004. And uh, in the year 2022, he was also made a fellow of the Geographical Society of China. So, Professor Betty, it is indeed our pleasure to have you here. And uh, as Professor Shantanu said, uh, we are eager to hear your ideas on complexities, cities, and planning. So, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak. Um, uh, as, uh, as our host has said, I'm going to talk about complexity in the new science of cities. Um, uh, I'll, 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 uh, my hosts will um, will interrupt me if there's any problem, basically, but I hope this will be a fairly smooth uh, delivery. Um, uh, let me say that if you want to look at the PDF of these slides, then obviously our hosts have the PDF, but uh, you can also click on uh, one of those links. The, uh, the blog link at the top is a bit complicated, but the tiny URL at the bottom of the screen um, uh, with the extension YM4M66XT. I will put that on at the, at the end. Uh, I know you can't remember that, but um, uh, you could probably take a photograph and so on. Uh, and if you do that and get access to it, then you'll see that um, uh, the PDF basically follows the uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'm about to give. Um, that actually is the tiny URL again, YM4M66XT. Uh, Okay, without more ado, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to begin by talking about the systems approach. Now, many of you, if not all of you, uh, will know about the systems approach. It's fairly generic to uh, certainly uh, mid to late 20th century science. Uh, but one of the kind of key issues about the systems approach is that it tends to treat systems uh, all the way from cities to societies to biological systems and so on. Uh, uh, to electrical and physical systems really from the top down to some extent. The, uh, the motivation for thinking of the system is top down. Now, uh, following that, following the systems approach, the, the notion really turned on its head. And the origins of complexity theory, uh, which to some extent is both a complement and an opposite to the systems approach, really conceives of systems from the bottom up. Uh, and a, a simple way of thinking about the systems approach from the top down to the complexity science approach from the bottom up is to think of uh, systems as being manufactured from the top down or organized while systems that grow from the bottom up actually evolve. So to some extent, uh, the systems approach really uh, thinks of systems as being more like machines, basically, mechanisms in that sense, whereas complexity theory tends to think of uh, systems as evolving, as it were, almost like biological systems or organisms, really, from the bottom up. Uh, and that will be the kind of theme that I'll be talking about uh, in the next five minutes or so. Uh, and I'll begin to uh, uh, talk about emergence and the evolution of cities, really with respect to the complexity approach. Um, the way we've looked at cities over the last 50 uh, to 100 years is really beginning with the systems approach and then um, in the uh, in the mid to in the in the late twentieth century, and certainly uh, until today, the complexity approach is really the complexity theory has really taken over in that sense. Uh, so I'll be really talking about this shift, if you like, in thinking about cities. It's very resonant, I think, uh, with what's happening in cities worldwide. Um, as the director said, um, urbanization is a proceeding apace. It's very likely by the end of this century that most people will live in cities of different sizes, to cities of one form or another. In that sense, the idea of the rural urban continuum is changing very dramatically in that sense. 
Uh, and really, by the end of this century, probably 95 percent of people uh, will be living in cities. They won't all be living in, in big cities. In fact, big cities, the proportion of all cities are getting a little bit small, uh, a little bit less uh, in that sense. But um, and of course, to be a big city, you have to be a little city first in that sense. And so we'll be talking really about a, a world where really everybody is living in cities of different uh, uh, of different shapes and sizes. Uh, I'll then talk about the geometry of cities, one of the kind of uh, watchwords of uh, thinking about how cities are organized uh, is this term form follows function, that a good deal of uh, uh, thinking about how uh, what we see in cities is, is really deep down in terms of their function. So in other words, you can't really understand cities without peeling back the layers of form that we see. Um, and looking at the functions that take place. Now, a lot of what I'll be talking about um, uh, uh, this afternoon, basically, uh, this evening in, the, in your context then, uh, is really about this whole question of how, how we look at the functions of cities and, how, and what that does in terms of the form. I'll then introduce a, a key idea that really relates to complexity theory, and that is fractals. Many of you, certainly those in physics, will have come across fractals uh, in this particular concept, but uh, classically, fractals are a very good uh, way of thinking about the geometry of cities uh, in this particular context. That'll take me into talking about networks, flows and linkages. These are all elements, if you like, of the complexity science applied to cities. Uh, and at that point, I'll pause slightly and switch tack. There are many different models of cities which are built on these ideas about form follows function, about networks, flows and linkages, many different types of models. Almost from the beginning of computing um, in the 19, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, in the 1950s, uh, models of transport systems were built and in the 60s, models of cities. Uh, computer models of cities have been built really uh, for the last um, 60 or 70 years in this context. The progress has not been very rapid because of data problems, basically. Um, but more importantly, at the present time, uh, our models of cities are being supplanted by ideas of cities in uh, operating within the short term. If we look at cities, we can think of cities evolving over the long term, basically, uh, which is urbanization to some extent and the, the emergence of uh, ever bigger cities in that context. But we can also think of cities um, evolving and changing in the very short term over the next five minutes, the next five hours, the next 15 minutes and so on, um, over the next 24 hours in a sense. And that really brings a whole uh, different set of models. The whole idea of smart cities, and I, I do realize that in India, uh, the smart city concept is very resonant with what's actually happening. The idea of smart cities is generally speaking related to these high frequency views of cities over, over, over a short term. I'll talk about land use transportation model, which is the, the, the longer term view of cities. I'll talk a little bit about that and then I'll talk about a couple of examples. I mean, I could spend a lecture again just talking about these different sorts of models, basically. But I just give you I want to give you a flavor of where and how these are being applied. And then at that point, I'll round off and um, uh, really make some general comments about the fact that in terms of this kind of science we're talking about, we're really just at the beginning in some senses, that um, it's taken a long time to get going. Uh, and the way we think about cities now is really quite different, I think, from the way we thought about them 100 years or so ago. OK, so let me begin. Ideas about the systems approach. Now, many of you, many of you know this, and I'm not going to uh, rehearse it in any great detail, but it, it, the systems approach became significant in the 20th century, probably in the early part of the 20th century, uh, when these ideas began to develop coherently uh, with respect to thinking of a whole set of systems that had not been organized um, in any coherent way, particularly biological systems, um, as having some kind of structure. Uh, in particular, the idea that, the, that a system could be organized as a hierarchy, that it could be controlled in some sense, uh, that it uh, manifested, uh, a system manifested itself in terms of subsystems and so on, elements and interactions and so on, um, and generally speaking, uh, re related to equilibrium. Uh, the, the, the ideas in cybernetics and operations research uh, 
uh, which were really the models, if you like, of, of, of systems in this particular context, uh, really, again, emerged in the middle of the 20th century um, with the development of computing to some extent. Uh, and the notion was that systems are ordered and organized really from the top down. And this, this order represented a kind of generic uh, notion of the fact that it, it could be seen in a whole variety of systems. Cities were very good examples of seeing this kind of order. In a sense, if you look at a city, if you look at a city in India, and if you look in a city in, in, in Western Europe, for example, or a city in Africa, you will find that there are certain very obvious things that tends to be a, a focus in the center. Cities grow uh, around a marketplace to some extent. Uh, they grow in different ways. They grow um, almost the way uh, a tree grows, it, branching out into their hinterlands and so on. Uh, the way they conserve energy in, in this particular context. And that kind of notion uh, was very generic to the idea of a system in this particular context. Now, the systems approach first began to be applied to cities uh, in the 1950s and 60s in this sense. Um, and systems were conceived as being centrally ordered, composed of subsystems organized hierarchically and dominated by negative feedback. This is very important that the way we thought of cities um, 50 or more years ago was that they were always in equilibrium uh, and the equilibrium was always restored by some kind of negative feedback in that sense. By and large, um, uh, this view of cities as being in equilibrium and dominated by uh, a negative feedback that sort of maintains their coherence and structure in that sense has really been thrown out by the development of complexity theory. The idea that cities are in equilibrium is no longer the dominant paradigm, basically, in that sense. Um, in fact, um, the origins of complexity theory are, are based on this notion that when we look at cities, uh, we think of them probably as being equilibrium. If you look at um, uh, the city I live in, for example, um, uh, London, uh, which was about um, 100 years ago, it was about uh, 8 million people. It's not so different today. Uh, obviously, it's a wider hinterland, but it's, it's still in the order of uh, 8 to 10 uh, to 12 million, that kind of thing. And the structure of the city is fairly similar at an aggregate level um, 100 years ago to uh, what it is today in this particular context. But in actual fact, um, when we look at a city, uh, what we get is, uh, is, is, is what we see, or rather what we get is not what we see in this particular context. We have to peel back the layers to figure it out. And cities are never in equilibrium. They're constantly changing. They're dominated not by negative, but by positive feedback. And they're also crucibles of innovation. They're crucibles of of, of disruption in some sense, that their behavior can be surprising, unpredictable, um, uh, uh, and that they can be much more volatile than their appearance suggests. So here we have a conundrum. The fact is that although cities look as though they're in equilibrium, uh, they look as though they're unchanging to some extent uh, in the large. In actual fact, um, everything is changing, basically. A good example is that the city of London, the core of London, for example, the city I live in, uh, which is the financial quarter, if you look over the last 70 years since the, second, the end of the Second World War, the, the city itself has been rebuilt about five times, that the buildings have changed something in the order of five or more times, uh, basically, a lot of the redevelopment, but the redevelopment has taken place in situ. The, the structure of the city has not changed much, but everything in it, everybody in the buildings, basically, uh, in the city uh, 70 years ago is very different uh, from now. For example, uh, in 1950, there were 50,000 manufacturing jobs, industrial jobs in the city of London. Uh, now there are something in the order of... Um, of 350,000 jobs, all in financial services, basically, in that sense. A massive change. If you look at the city in 1950, it looks fairly similar uh, to what it looks today. OK, the buildings are newer, basically, in that sense. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, what we get is not what we see in this sense. We have to peel back these layers to actually figure how it works. And complexity theory is really all about peeling, peeling back these layers. It's not inconsistent with the systems approach. It's a different kind of systems approach that turns on its 
uh, to the notion of complexity sciences in that sense. Okay, so uh, the notion that cities uh, cities grow in this particular context is that they grow uh, differentially in some sense. And and uh, in the nineteen sixties uh, uh, and seventies, with the with the slow emergence of complexity theory, lots of ideas about uh, the dynamics of cities appeared, um, uh, which came really from physics in some sense and mathematics. So ideas about catastrophe theory, ideas about how cities bifurcated as they grew, they growing on different uh, trajectories in that sense, the whole notion that there might be chaos contained in uh, the, the growth of cities, etc. Many of these ideas uh, in terms of dynamical systems came onto the agenda and people began to think that cities rather than being in equilibrium clearly they were in dis also took a hold in that sense and the notion of positive feedback of course was essential uh, to these sorts of dynamics uh, now much of the uh, the formal development of these ideas uh, really came from uh, the development of the mainstream complexity sciences uh, promoted, for example, by uh, uh, centers such as the Santa Fe Institute in uh, in uh, New Mexico, uh, which gathered together a variety of uh, 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 eminent uh, scientists in uh, physics and in economics, basically, uh, to think about the, the great superstructure of ideas that really related to the idea of systems um, evolving really from the bottom up in that sense, and these re these represented the kind of uh, key ideas of of, uh, of of complexity theory. Let me say what some of these key ideas are. We've already talked a little bit about them in a sense. The key issue is that cities grow and change from the bottom up, and that the order that we see in cities and pat and, and the patterns that emerge uh, from the the basic soup really in this sense. Uh, the, 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 the order and patterns that actually emerge are often surprising. It's actually difficult to figure out why these patterns emerge if we just look at the, the bottom up in this particular context. Uh, so patterns emerge, really. Uh, the organization in cities emerges really from uh, the, uh, the the rapid and uh, continuous uh, making of decisions really at the bottom up. If we look at our individual decisions, um, we can't really state our, how our individual decisions about development uh, lead to the kind of growth of cities that we see. Uh, although the, the fact that we, we tend to behave in fairly similar ways uh, really leads to the fact that um, the decisions we make uh, in terms of uh, developing in cities uh, leads ultimately to the patterns that we see. Indeed, if you look at planning, for example, in cities, planning is relatively um, uh, low key in terms of most cities. I'll show you some pictures in a moment uh, of the way we think of cities in this particular context as complex systems uh, evolving from the bottom up. Uh, and it's fairly difficult in, in the pictures that I'll show you to actually figure out that any of this was actually organized from the top down. Planning is a top down type of, of thinking and most cities uh, everywhere, basically, in a sense, are not planned in any sense. And that's an important issue. That doesn't mean to say that they're chaotic. It doesn't mean to say that uh, the fact there is, isn't planning um, in the traditional sense uh, by government, etc. It doesn't mean to say that that's a bad thing in a way, uh, because there is planning at the most basic level at the basic level of human human understanding so emergence really the emergence of order and pattern is really the key basically it suggests no overall control it talk, it, it reflects limits on predictability and it also reinforces this notion that history matters the history of where we've come from the idea of path dependence which is central to complexity theory the idea that the path we take makes a difference is really all important in this particular concept. Now, many of the old ideas in systems theory, hierarchy, interaction, subsystem structure, and so on, they're still important and they're complementary. They're part and parcel of this wider science now uh, of complexity in that particular context. So the systems approach emerged, I think, from ideas in biology uh, and control engineering operations research. And this really was based on the machine analogy. Complexity theory uh, 
is based on systems as evolutionary systems, and that's really based on the idea of the organic analogy. Now, I just want to throw up some names, basically, here of people who anticipated the development of the idea of the systems approach. Uh, there are uh, four people here, Herbert Simon, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, economics, basically, about 30, 40, 30 years or so ago. Jane Jacobs, who wrote a very influential book on uh, cities called The uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. Christopher Alexander, who is uh, uh, who was an architect, I think has passed away recently, but uh, uh, an architect uh, talking about um, the emergence of form from the bottom up. And Warren Weaver, who actually wrote a very influential paper um, about uh, 60 or 70 years ago, uh, dealing with these ideas about complexity theory. Here's a picture of the books uh, that they wrote that uh, you can see here, the, um, the Death and Life of Great American Cities on the left by Jane Jacobs. Her book was all about the fact that cities were being destroyed in the United States uh, in the interest of modernism and modern architecture in the middle of the last century. And the, the kind of diversity uh, that you see in cities, the chaos and diversity, she argued, were absolutely essential to cities, the, this idea of community in some sense. And this is being destroyed by top-down planning, basically. So her book is all about that. It's a very prescient book, meaning that um, uh, it was really... Uh, talking about uh, something that, that many people have now begun to adopt, basically, the idea that we need diversification in cities, and that diversification is part and parcel of the idea of cities being complex systems. Warren Weaver wrote his... Uh, he was the... Um, uh, the uh, director, I think, of the Rockefeller Foundation uh, after the war, and he wrote a very influential paper in 1948 called Science and Complexity. Herbert Simon, the Nobel Prize winner, who is, uh, got his Nobel Prize for economics, although he's mainly a, a, an early advocate of artificial intelligence, he wrote a paper called The Architecture of Complexity, um, and Christopher Alexander wrote a very influential paper in the 60s called A City is Not a Tree. Now, these ideas are collected together um, in, in a lot that's been written about complexity theory since. My own book, Cities and Complexity, that, uh, um, uh, that was referred to earlier on, uh, basically tends to, to cover these points uh, in that sense. Okay, let me um, uh, begin to give some, uh, some visual substance to this particular lecture um, and, and begin to actually illustrate some of these ideas in terms of what cities look like. Um, and I'll demonstrate them in terms of the kind of patterns that we see in cities from a certain perspective. Clearly, when we look at cities, we can look at cities at different scales. And the scale that I'll be looking at really is the is what we might call the urban design or district scale upwards. I'm not really looking here at... Uh, the inside of um, uh, small communities or neighborhoods in that sense, although a lot of the ideas do apply to that. I'll be looking really at cities um, uh, from the sort of, um, uh, from the whole city point of view to some extent. Well, you'll see in a moment, basically, in this particular context. Now, here's an example um, of um, a city, my own city. This is London, uh, basically. And um, uh, there's a number of interesting features here. It doesn't look as though it's planned in any sense. Uh, where you see these these big open areas, uh, east to west and uh, uh, the middle to the north, there, those are rivers, basically, the River Thames east to west and the River Lee, which is uh, from the Thames going north, basically, in that sense. Uh, it, it, that uh, There's no scale on this, and that's quite purposeful because, to some extent, um, if you drill down and you looked at these different clusters statistically, these clusters of, um, of development, basically, urban development uh, in that sense, uh, and the coloration, which is very simple, really yellow through red, is the density in that sense. But if you drill down and you looked at these clusters statistically at different levels, they would appear similar in that sense, uh, in a sense. So I, if I take a, a little bit of a cluster here, on the northwest, basically, and look at it statistically, and then look at the whole cluster, the whole cluster of Greater London, basically, in this context, then you'd see there's a degree of similarity in that sense. And that really is the essence of the idea that um, uh, the geometry of this structure 
is what we call fractal. I'll come on to that in a moment, basically. But here, here for example, we see a typical city. We don't know what scale it is. Uh, and in fact, I think the next example show you that uh, uh, if we blow it up, basically, then what we've been looking at is the is the bottom bit here uh, in London in that context. And you can see that all our cities uh, uh, basically um, have the sim a similar statistical shape in that sense. And that represents a fractal. A fractal is a geometric object that scales, basically. The shape of it is similar at different scales in that particular way. I'll come on to say more about that in a moment. Um, we can actually scale up even further. Um, I should make the point, and I'll come back to this, that if we were to count uh, the size of these clusters, basically, then we would have many, many small clusters compared to the big clusters. So th this is an important issue in terms of the idea of cities, that we're more likely to have a very large number of little cities uh, than um, uh, a large number of big cities. In fact, we have very few big cities. Normally, uh, in many nations, we really only have one big city, which is the capital city, and then the next level down. So, for example, um, in, 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 uh, in Britain, we've got London, which is the capital city, by far the biggest, uh, 10 to 12 million, that kind of thing. We've then got... Um, uh, in the hierarchy of cities, we've got uh, Birmingham, which is about 3 million, and Manchester about 3 million again, and so on down the hierarchy. I'll come back to that in a sense. And that's a kind of key issue in terms of the idea of fractals and um, uh, self-similarity. OK, I've scaled up again, and you can actually see Britain there. You can see the big cities, basically London, Birmingham, Manchester as we go up, uh, and then uh, West Yorkshire. Uh, Newcastle and uh, the central lowlands of Scotland, that's uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, basically. And then I have a, a night lights photograph of uh, Western Europe uh, on the right. And you can see that the same sorts of patterns. Were we to look at India, ind indeed, I have a, a picture of, um, uh, of uh, Kolkata, I think, uh, uh, later on, taken from a database, uh, which shows you the same sorts of patterns. Now, this is what we're really dealing with in some sense in cities, that we're having to make sense of how cities grow in this particular context. Uh, uh, a certain number of cities are growing, um, uh, the, the big cities are growing, basically. They're also beginning to fuse. As the world becomes entirely urbanized, cities are beginning to join together. So. Our notions about how we thought of cities in the past are actually changing in this particular way. Uh, now, this is not uh, this is not India. I've got a picture later on. Basically, this was uh, uh, this is Sao Paulo. But it's interesting in the sense that you can see Sao Paulo in uh, um, in, in in Brazil, basically, um, not far away from the coast, basically. But you can also see uh, the the way, in fact, the city is spreading out in different directions. One of the kind of key issues in terms of the the emergence of cities, how cities change, is that they spread out, but they don't spread out evenly everywhere. They spread out in these dendritic patterns that, that in some sense, you can think of uh, a city uh, as processing energy, and we can't really develop land everywhere. We can only develop it in certain places, certainly in terms of the road systems that act and transport systems that actually feed our cities that bring people um, and goods and so on into the city and out of the city in that sense. We can't have roads everywhere. We can only have them in, in a certain place. And they tend to grow in much the same way as lots of dendritic systems, network systems grow in that sense. Here, for example, you can see some uh, you can see some examples of classic uh, dendrites. Basically, there's a little diagram on the left. Basically, that's taken from Darwin's Charles Darwin notebook. Basically, the only example he had in the notebook of a, a tree system in that sense classification. And then you can see the human lung, and then you can see a model of um, uh, various nerves uh, in in the body. Basically, uh, in this particular context, and you can see how these things spread out. Um, if we looked at a growth system in that sense, they would grow really from a seed or a core, and they would grow out in this particular way, in a sense. The best example, of course, are trees, basically. So here's a leaf, for example, and you can see that in some sense contained in the leaf is the, is, is the module or the, the, the pattern, basically, to actually grow the entire tree. So let's have a look at some, let's have a look at some pictures here. Now, th these are a bit clearer. 
uh, in terms of networks. I've sort of thrown away development here. So on the top left, we've got um, a picture of the night lights in Tokyo, and you can sort of see uh, the clustering uh, in Tokyo around Tokyo Bay, but you can also see the uh, the dendritics, the roots basically out of Tokyo, you can sort of just about make out through the light nights. The idea that there is a, a, a circularity to the growth of the core outwards basically, but also these, uh, these main roots basically uh, running out in this particular context. Tokyo is about um, uh, 30 million. There aren't 30 million in this picture. There's probably only about uh, about uh, about 15 million basically in the picture it's bigger than that um but if we turn to the the right hand picture the top right hand picture is a small town in uh, in 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 the midlands of england uh which is wolverhampton um uh, and uh, you can actually see the uh, the way the road system has developed naturally basically and you can also see an element of top down planning you, you can see the ring road around the center in the center there there is the that's the, the town center and the scale is very different in tokyo here on the top right we're talking about um uh something in the order of about 150 kilometers east and west in this context in wolverhampton we're talking about only about two or three kilometers east west basically uh, and uh, we've got a couple of pictures of london here of retailing and you can see the way things are are growing out. They're not covering everywhere. They're just covering certain uh, certain areas in a sense because we don't have enough resources to grow everywhere in this particular context. Uh, and then you can see another couple of examples of flows in this sense. So it's very important when you're thinking of cities to think of flows in that sense. The flows kind of um, really represent the way the city hangs together in that sense. OK, now I could talk for hours about these sorts of patterns. I'm not going to, basically. But um, uh, a lot of these ideas really uh, were first developed um, maybe 50 or 60 years ago um, uh, and have come to be called fractals in some sense. Benoit Mandelbrot uh, uh, wrote a, a great uh, article in um, Science, the journal Science in 1967, called How Long is the Coastline of Britain? And he, which introduced the idea of fractals of fractal geometry in this particular context. Um, uh, and also uh, the answer, of course, to his, uh, his, uh, his question in the paper was that the length of the coastline is infinite. So fractals tend to be geometry between dimensions, really, in that sense. Um, uh, and they throw up their own complexity in that sense. Um, they also generate systems that are self-similar. If we look at a fractal, um, at, uh, at one scale, then we can see the same kind of modularity, the same geometry appearing uh, at the other scale. So here are some examples of fractals, basically, and you can see that uh, we've taken a, um, a module uh, and begun to break it down in terms of systems and subsystems, etc. You can see a kind of hierarchical pattern here, uh, and then down at the bottom of that, uh, uh, those slides I've shown, we show the dendrites basically, uh, and you can also see how we've we've taken that model of uh, uh, of how the system might grow really from a seed, uh, a dendrite. This is called a, di a, a diffusion limited aggregation model, it's like a cellular automata to some extent. And you can see what we've done is to um, we can't quite read this, but this is the town. Actually, this is the town of Cardiff basically. Um, in uh, South Wales, basically the capital of Wales, basically. Uh, and you can actually see how we've planted uh, this very simple model of diffusion um, and, and growth, basically, uh, into, into the sort of container of Cardiff. The uh, Cardiff sits on the coast, basically, in that sense, and how we can grow it under different assumptions. Um, and a lot of this stuff is contained in our book, which uh, we wrote 30 odd years ago. Uh, by me and Paul Longley called Fractal Cities. Uh, you can actually get it online, sort of uh, www.fractalcities, all one word, dot org, basically. You just key it into Google or any search engine and you'll get it, basically. Okay, so let me say something about fractals. Let me just check, um, let me just check, uh, let me just check timing, basically. I'm just looking at my phone, okay. 1840. You're, you're fine, Professor. Yeah, you may take okay. as much time as you want. Okay, no problems. Okay, so we'll talk. We'll we'll now talk a little bit about fractals.
uh, and, uh, and, and continue this. And then we'll get to the point where we'll talk about networks, uh, a little bit more on networks, and then I'll actually uh, change tack and talk a little bit about models, how we make these things work and what we might do with them uh, with respect to thinking about building uh, better cities and better plans for cities. Okay, so this whole question, um, in a sense, uh, that I've been addressing really, relating to uh, the idea of, of modularity um, and replication at different scales, is referred to as scaling to some extent. Many of you in physics will know about scaling, that uh, there are many uh, laws in physics which are scaling laws uh, in this particular context, in a sense. And one of the kind of key issues pertaining to a pure scaling law um, is that at any uh, level, uh, the same sort of relationship exists at different scales. When we scale um, a power law, for example, when we scale the equation uh, in some sense, then uh, the, same, the same relationship exists at different scales. And we can see that. We've already seen that in terms of these ideas about fractals in this particular context. One of the kind of key issues is that Fractals are really objects that are between dimensions that, in fact, the, the world, in fact, um, as we tend to uh, learn about it um, uh, in geometry, is regarded as being um, uh, in terms of the integer dimensions So, uh, in that context. So, for example, a point is zero dimension, a line is one, uh, a plane is two, a volume is three, and so on. But a fractal... Um, exists between dimensions. It has fract fra fractional dimension in that sense. Now, uh, to some extent, I don't intend to, uh, to go into it, but there's some good examples of thinking about this, that we can actually measure complex systems that have fractal, uh, uh, that are generated um, in terms of their patterns through fractals. Um, and, 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 and the idea of the fractal dimension is quite important. So uh, a good example of a fractal uh, which exists between uh, two and three dimensions. Uh, I'm going to show you the next slide. This is a piece of paper. You take a flat piece of paper and you crumple it. Of course, I can't do this uh, uh, literally because we're in a, a virtual talk, basically. But if I was in the lecture room, I'd take uh, a flat piece of paper uh, and I'd say, OK, to the class, well, um, this is um, uh, two dimensions, basically. Most people would agree that that's the case in terms of Euclidean dimensions. And then when I scrubble it up, like these bits of paper here, um, in a sense, I'd say, well, what is the dimension now? And of course, to some extent, um, there is a fractal dimension. Now, these are not fractals because they, they don't quite meet the, the constraints for uh, a, a pure fractal uh, with fractal, fractional dimensions between one and two. But generally speaking, you can sort of guess the fact that it's a bit more than one, the fractal dimension, um, and it's a bit less than two in that context. A very good example is to put a pen on a piece of paper uh, and to begin to draw and keep the pen stuck on the paper. Well, what you're drawing is a line, which is one dimension, but if you keep your pen going indefinitely and coloring it in uh, with a continuous line then eventually you'll get a a two-dimensional shape in that context now trees are classic examples of fractals because you can see the modularized a couple of computer trees there basically in my leaf again uh, and you can sort of see the tips of the uh, the tips of the trees the branches have the same structure as the whole thing if you break off a little bit of twig there basically from this computer generated tree and you scale it up you magnify it up to the same size of the tree you would find it would be statistically similar to the whole the whole thing and that the tree is perhaps the classic example the dendrite of a fractal in this particular context um okay now i'm gonna i'm gonna miss that because just a little bit of uh, algebra basically in that sense um okay so uh what we're really talking about in this context um, is ideas that really relate to scale in some sense. So, and one of the things that I mentioned earlier on was that um, when we look at the number of cities, uh, then we have a few uh, large cities and a very large number of small cities. Now, there is a relationship. Well, of course, we could argue uh, that not all cities be, can become big. It takes a lot of energy uh, 
and resources for a city to become big. And the reason why not everywhere is a big city in, in that sense uh, is that uh, to some extent we don't have enough resources to make everywhere a big city in that sense. And there are diseconomies of scale too, to some extent, uh, which, which, which keep our cities uh, below a certain threshold. They're always pushing towards that threshold and growing in that sense. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look. Now, um, there are some theories in urban geography about landscapes, basically. This is a, um, a book that was written in 1933 by Chris Stahler called Central Places in Southern Germany. And what he argued was that when we looked at the cities and the hinterlands around them, if you can think of India and your big cities and small cities and the sphere of influence, the hinterland around them, then there is a regular relationship. Now, Chris Stahler called it uh, central place theory, uh, meaning that there were big central cities and around them there were smaller cities, basically, and there was a sort of degree of dependence in the hinterlands in that sense. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. That's implied in a lot of the patterns I'm actually showing you. Uh, but what we can actually begin to say is if we count the big cities and we count the little cities and we look at the relationships between them, then they follow what is probably the only iron law there is uh, in the social sciences in that sense, which is called Zipf's law. Now, this is classic. Now, this is taken from Zipf's book, Human Behavior and Least Effort in 1949. Zipf was actually a professor of German, the German language, basically, at Harvard University. But, you know, in his spare time, he was interested in a whole set of empirical relationships. Now, what you're seeing in this slide is that on the vertical axis, uh, and it's, it's a logarithmic axis in this context, I'll come back to that in a moment. On the vertical axis, you have the size of cities, basically, on the vertical axis. So you can see that um, two point, this is the log, basically, the log, log 10, um, uh, log to the base 10, 2.5, 10, 100, 1000, and so on uh, in this particular context. On the horizontal axis, we have the rank. So if you take all the cities and you rank them from the biggest to the smallest, basically, in that sense, and you plot uh, those, uh, those cities by rank uh, on a logarithmic scale in this particular context, then they follow a straight line. If we didn't have a logarithmic scale, then they would follow a power law, an inverse power law in that sense. But the, the way we think about them is to plot them on a straight line. And what you can see, this is the, these are the top cities uh, in the United States from 1780, which is the lower line here at the bottom, all the way through to 1930. Remember, Zip wrote his book in 1949. Of course, all of this stuff has been brought up to date. There are plenty. And of course, what is interesting is that we have this relationship which is stable. Uh, the big cities um, uh, remain big in this particular context, but some of them drop up and down the hierarchy in a sense. Although in the United States, the biggest city really from 1790, which is the, when the data began, that's when the first uh, US census was produced. Um, the first, uh, the biggest city has been New York. It remained as the as the biggest city ever on. Because it back in 1790, there was no Chicago, there was no Los Angeles and so on. So all of these cities have actually come on to the curve, basically, as it's actually grown. Now, this is really an iron law. It's quite consistent with ideas about scaling. It's quite consistent with my pictures about uh, Britain and the number of cities. Um, I wonder if I can go back to, to show you this. Let me just go back very, very quickly. Uh, okay, yeah, we've got we've got there quite quickly. Um, if I go back to here, for example, uh, let me go back to this. In a sense. So in other words, if I were to measure I decide on a boundary behind the be, be, between on these clusters, uh, and I graph the uh, log of the size of each cluster against its rank in that context, then it would give me a power law, and it would give me um, a straight line on log log paper, just as we did with zip, basically. And the same for Europe, and the same for India. In fact, I think, in fact, I'm coming back towards uh, where we were uh, in that context. Uh, and I think my next slide, in fact, shows 
Uh, I just picked this off the web this morning. Basically, population in thousands on the vertical axis, the log scale, you can see uh, the rank on the horizontal axis. And you can see this is done for uh, for cities in different countries. And in fact, India is marked out there that the orange color, you can just about make it out, um, is the uh, rank size rule for India. And you can see that wherever you are in the world, this rank size rule uh, operates in some sense. To some extent, it's kind of obvious, really, because any system that is capacitated by resources, if you have a system where an object grows from small to big, um, and it, it's, it's capacitated by the resources you have available for growth in that sense, then you're very likely to get some kind of power law relationship. Um, obviously, this is for cities, but word frequencies uh, in languages, and Zip himself did some work on this, uh, but also, for example, incomes, income distributions, where you have uh, a very small number of very, very rich people and a very large number of very poor people in that sense. It's a power law in this particular context. So that is really pretty key, I think, to a whole notion about how big cities are and how big they're likely to be. Uh, um, there's lots of other things that we can say about cities in terms of their economies of agglomeration or scale uh, as they grow. I'm not going to talk about that here, uh, but in terms of thinking about how uh, how how big cities should be, or how small cities should be, and the kind of sustainability of cities in this context, then we need to have recourse uh, to these these relationships. It's very difficult, I think, to um, if we were to build a new city, for example, uh, and to implant it into this rank size relationship in a top down it's very difficult to know whether it whether it would fit in fact where people have built brand new cities like well i think shandigar is an example um i think uh, brasilia um in in brazil is an example where these these cities have been built from the top down basically what's actually happened is that they've gradually begun to find their place in the natural hierarchy in this particular context. Okay. okay, so basic conundrums and paradoxes. I'm talking about uh, fractals. Now, I'm going to speed this up, basically. I mentioned Mandelbrot's famous paper, How Long is the Coastline of Britain? Um, and in terms of the uh, the coastline of Britain, he argued that it was infinite. In fact, he then went on to argue, and of course, this is the correct question, uh, infinite is not a, a sensible answer. Uh, in that context. Uh, the sensible answer is that the coastline of Britain, how long is it, really depends on the scale. It depends on the, on, on the measurement. Now, here's an example called a Koch curve in fractals, uh, where we have a little Koch island. And what we do here, we construct a fractal by taking, if we look at the left-hand picture here, we take the triangle and we scale down the triangle to a third of its size and we stick the bits along the edge. So from A to B there, basically, we're sticking a copy of the triangle suitably scaled down uh, to, the, uh, to the size of the triangle. And we keep on doing this. And if we keep on doing this, you can see that each time we do it uh, in terms of this hierarchy, then we increase the length of the side by 4 over 3. So um, on A, we have 3. And on B, we have uh, four over three uh, in this context for each of the sides. And then we have four over three times four over three uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, if you think of that four over three to the power of n, where n is the number of uh, iterations, basically, or the number of uh, steps in the hierarchy, then ultimately, though, it's very easy to demonstrate that it leads to infinity, basically. So the, the, the area around the, around the curve um, is infinite in this sense, but the but the volume being preserved by the curve is actually finite. And that's one of the conundrums really of fractals. And you can see on the right hand side, you can see how I've blown that up. Uh, the middle one shows you the initiator, then the generator, uh, and then the curve, which we keep on applying. Um, and on the right hand side, we can see that there is a clear hierarchy involved uh, in this particular in this particular structure. Now, here are some examples of uh, Renaissance towns in Italy um, with fortification. You can see how people uh, quite naturally use the idea of um, 
increasing the, the, the length of the wall uh, around the town, basically. Remember that um, until the modern age, really, until the Industrial Revolution, uh, many, many towns were surrounded by uh, by walls uh, for defensive purposes, basically. Uh, and these are, uh, are idealized towns that were proposed uh, during the Renaissance in Italy some 500 years or so ago. Here, for example, uh, I'm generating fractals uh, using a module. This is uh, uh, a superb example, and it's 30 years or more old, basically. This is Barnsley's Fern from his book Fractals Everywhere, which is generated using a fairly simple system of, of showing the uh, transformations uh, contained in the elements, basically, and actually scaling these transformations um, to produce this particular picture. And here are trees in that sense. There's lots of examples of this. A lot of the stuff that you see in uh, in uh, computer graphics, uh, in movies, basically, uh, trees and so on, are generated using these fractal generation algorithms, essentially. Now, I've shown you most of this, morphologies at different scales, uh, in, in a sense, and I've also shown you uh, the notion about how networks pertain to these uh, development patterns, basically. Um, and um, uh, here are some more examples, basically. There's um, uh, an interesting example top Top, top left, where we have uh, the city of Berlin. I mean, you remember that um, uh, after the Second World War, Berlin was a divided city. Uh, of course, prior to the Second World War, Berlin was the capital of Germany, um, and it had the same sort of structures you see uh, of, of most cities, which were not constrained by putting a wall through them. When the wall was put through uh, in the 1950s or 1960, whenever it was, uh, then basically the, the functions were separated. But at the end of the Cold War, uh, when the wall came down, it, it took very little time for the city to heal itself and for things to grow back together, basically. So you can see there are networks everywhere. I've shown you the two, two other pictures. On the top left, uh, sorry, the bottom left is a picture of the internet. If we were to map the internet, uh, it's almost impossible to map, of course, it is impossible to map now, etc. But this was back uh, th uh, at the beginning of the development of the network. This is from the uh, San Diego Computing Center, basically. Uh, and it, if you were to map the, the Internet, well, then we'd see these massive hubs such as uh, Google and Yahoo and so on, etc. Um, uh, almost impossible to visualize what the mapping of the Internet would be today, basically, in that sense. OK, now I'm talking about scaling laws. I'm going to go through these very quickly because I'm very conscious of time here. So the classic signature of scaling is the power law. We've seen that basically, et cetera. Um, and there are lots of examples of power laws in cities. So a city of P persons, for example, has potentially P squared interactions. One of the advantages of a city is that it brings people together. It, arguably, cities are places where people come together uh, and do things that involve their interactions, basically, in that sense. That's the division of labor. That's the reason why everybody moved from the countryside to the city, basically, so they could actually engage in pursuits which were close to one another and where you've got critical mass. And so you could argue that a city of P persons has potentially P squared interactions. Now, that's certainly not the case. If you live in a, a, a town of a hundred, uh, uh, village of a hundred people, it's very rare that you would have a hundred squared uh, interactions uh, in that context. You might know most of them in a sense, so it's not out of the question. But if you had a thousand people, a thousand squared interactions is a million. You would never have a million friends, basically, or a million interactions in that particular context. So, in other words, uh, the, the scaling you can see is important in the sense of, of, of what's happening as, as things grow bigger, basically. Now, this is called allometry. It's related to agglomeration in economics and so on. Uh, and there are a number of scaling laws uh, that are really relevant to the size of cities that I don't have really time to go into. But these are developed by the, um, uh, by the physicists at Santa Fe, such as Jeff West and uh, Lewis Betancourt in that tip. Now, there are lots of examples of these laws. For example, uh, the idea of uh, potential connections, basically, uh, increasing as the square of the population. This is often called uh, Metcalfe's law. It's the sort of network equivalent of Moore's law, really, uh, in a sense. 
So Metcalfe's law talks about um, uh, how uh, the number of interactions grows as the net uh, as the network or the nodes on the network actually increase. Uh, in this particular context, it can be applied not only to cities but to uh, lots of systems in that sense. Uh, we have density laws, uh, in a sense, that uh, look at how densities change um, as cities uh, grow in that sense, and how densities change as you move away from the, the, the action or the central point in the city. Um, uh, in that sense, we have Brand's law, which says as cities get bigger, they tend to get greener. This is observed. We've got Zip's law. We talked about that. Uh, in a sense. So we have a whole range of different laws, basically, that really relate to scaling. Um, and there's a good book by uh, Lewis Betancourt, uh, MIT Press, called An Introduction to Urban Science, came out last year. Uh, and on, in that book, he, he, he specializes in thinking about scaling in this particular context and how cities actually scale in this particular way. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these. It'll take me a little while in sense, and uh, you have the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint if you need, but there are lots of uh, laws in that sense. Let me say something before I move on to talking about how we might operationalize some of this stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about networks, basically, because what has happened, and I'm sure many people are aware of this, that uh, in physics uh, in the last, um, 20 years or so, there's been a resurrection of network science, basically. Prior to, um, uh, really, I think, prior to the millennium, prior to uh, the year 2000, uh, most work on networks was done in sociology, social networks. But what began to happen, I think, in the 1990s was that uh, there was a new view of networks as statistical artifacts in that sense and people like Barabasi and um, uh, Steve Strogatz and uh, Duncan Watts and so on began to look at the properties of networks in this particular because networks of course as we've seen are fractals in this particular context so there's a lot of work being done on networks in a sense and if you look at cities uh, and here are some uh, modern and uh, also historical examples of cities networks are really absolutely key to the idea of how a city actually functions. So the top left-hand graph, um, uh, which is, we've got, you can just about make out the town of Dublin. This is on, uh, uh, in Ireland, basically, which is the, uh, the other main island in the British Isles. Um, and um, uh, you have Dublin. And this is actually a map of traffic flow, but in 1837. Now, I always like to ask my audience, if we were doing this physically, you know, what exactly was traffic in, why did the British Army conduct this traffic survey in, 19, in 1837, right? Well, of course, any, any, any um, uh, uh, school, uh, any, anybody uh, who's trained in the British system, in, in Britain itself, basically, has done a bit of economic history, will know that, um, uh, the railways, the first passenger railways were built in 1830, and the British government decided they were thinking about a railway in Ireland, basically, in a sense, and uh, they did a traffic survey to figure it out. Now, the traffic on these roads was horses and carts, basically, etc., in that sense. If we scan through all of these other pictures, there's migration on the immediate right, basically, uh, and then we have flows on the tube system in London in the top left, and then we have a blood flow map a congestion map in Lisbon, basically, showing animated traffic in a sense. So lots of different sorts of flows in this particular context. Uh, here are some other pictures which go back in, in time, basically, and some of which are uh, modern. The, the bottom uh, left-hand map is of uh, flows on our public transport system, actually flows on the tube system. The tube is only one bit of rail transport in London. It's only a tiny bit, to be honest, I mean, given all the other lines in that sense. Uh, but we have excellent um, uh, Oyster card data. We actually have excellent smart card data, which enables us to actually look at the heterogeneity and homogeneity of different patterns over days, but over, over minutes and hours, in a sense. In other words, the, the whole idea of the smart city and mobility in that sense uh, is really contained in, in these sorts of maps here in the, in the bottom left-hand corner.
Uh, so these are abstract flow maps, basically, just putting them on very quickly. Uh, in that sense, you've seen some of those. Uh, and here, for example, uh, this was taken from the Global Human Settlements database. So we have Kolkata and uh, Dakar, basically. So um, there's um, um, uh, basically a, an online uh, resource, basically, that you can pull all this stuff up. This is showing you density, but it also shows you pattern. It shows you it shows you that nobody, first of all, nobody planned it. It also shows you that uh, clusters at all scales are important. It shows you uh, that in some senses, scaling is central to all of this. Uh, and it also shows you that networks are central in that sense. So all of the things I've been talking about are sort of contained in this picture. Uh, and to make sense of them, we need new theories, we need uh, new ideas to put them together and to explain them and to explain how they change and grow in that sense. So as our cities grow, they're becoming more complicated uh, in that sense and they're spreading out in a sense. So some of these ideas are changing as they grow. That's one of the kind of features of cities that the knowledge we have of cities doesn't stand still. In fact, we have to run to keep up with the change in cities at the present time. So it's the increasing challenges of actually dealing with these sorts of explanations. OK, and here's a picture of uh, one or two pictures now of, uh, of social media, which is very much to do with smart cities. That's Facebook. Uh, and here we have some tweets, basically, um, uh, where we have the, uh, the night lights, uh, the Tokyo picture again in the top left. Uh, and then we have some tweets uh, in El Flickr, which is uh, uh, recording where people uh, record their camera uh, snaps, basically, um, the locations, and then tweets both in London on the bottom left and in Europe, basically, showing you flows. Now, of course, you know, arguably what the tweets mean, um, they're not exactly uh, movements of people to work or shop or anything like this. Uh, so we have to have some caution in interpreting stuff. But there's a lot of this social media which is giving us new insights and new pictures of the patterns in cities that, uh, that that make them work in that sense. Okay, now I'm going to spend about five or ten minutes to finish off by talking about building models of city systems. I've thrown onto the table a lot of ideas about complexity and so on uh, that really um, represent the rudiments, if you like, of um, uh, of uh, ideas that could be contained in models of cities that are used to enable us to make sense of what we see and also to enable us to make predictions um, or inform predictions uh, in a sense or what if type predictions in terms of thinking about, uh, about models. Now, there are many different types of models that pick up different aspects of what I'm saying. Uh, some of them, the, the most long standing models are land use transport interaction models uh, which are based on ideas that some of which we've seen about gravitation, etc., and movement. Um, uh, the fact that uh, people are more likely to travel short distances than long distances, uh, gravitational type hypotheses. But there are also um, ABM, agent based models, there are cellular automata models, there are micro simulation models, there are lots of different sorts of models that are being built. So the rest of my talk is really about land use transportation models. So let me give you an idea of a typical land use transportation model that builds on some of these ideas uh, that we've been seeing with. So let's imagine that the world's divided into employment and population, basically. Now, a typical land use transportation model takes something like employment and it works out where people live. OK, so you can see in this little block diagram uh, that um, uh, this is where people work uh, and this is where people live in that sense. Uh, and so we build a model of the flows between where people work and where they live. Uh, and then we scale up where they live into households, that's population. So we've linked our employment um, and economy to our demography and population. In that sense, the population demands to be serviced in terms of shops and other kinds of employment. And we get a flow in that direction. So you could think of this as being a journey to work model. 
and then a shopping model to some extent or a retailing model and then retailing of course is part of employment in some sense so they're kind of connected up so there's a degree of circularity one of the things about the urban system is we have to break into it at some point and figure out how it works basically in that sense um, uh, and um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of that, but there's a lot of work about thinking about how we break in to what is effectively a system that we observe as a cross section in time, which is simultaneous in a way. So that's a very simple model. Now we can. Uh, this is employment to population and back to employment. We could think of that as being replicated many, many times. So a land use transportation model would take different types of employment different types of population. It would take different flows. These people can travel on different modes of transport and so on in this particular context. And so in some senses, um, this is a kind of a template or a module that we can replicate it many times. Uh, th there it is again. And we can actually, we can not only think of this as physical movements, we can think of it as movements of money, basically, etc. Wages and revenues are generated in employment. Uh, we spend money to actually, um, you know, visit uh, where we live, basically. We have to buy where we live, basically, house prices. Uh, and then we spend money going back to the, uh, the shopping centers and so on. So there's a circularity of money in this, as well as a circularity of movement, basically. So that's, in essence, the land use transport model. Now, these models have been applied for a number of years. Um, uh, what we're going to look at is the land use transport model in this particular project. We had a project about 10 years ago, which was looking at climate change in London. And we had lots of different groups uh, in a consortium uh, to put together different models. So the Moses model was a, a demographic micro simulation model built at Leeds. Uh, the UK input output models were built at Cambridge by uh, land economy, uh, Cambridge Econometrics uh, group there. Uh, we developed the land use transport model. I'll show you a picture in a moment. And then the population site model here, uh, it was a GIS model scaling it down. And then the flooding models uh, and the emission models, the local climate models were used because essentially this was a project dealing with the uh, potential uh, rise in the level of the North Sea uh, through climate change. Uh, and of course, the London has a very big flood plain. It has had some major floods in the last three or four hundred years. A massive flood in 1953, which also affected the Netherlands, basically, surge tides in the North Sea. Uh, and so a lot of uh, stuff has been put in place over the last 50 years to actually uh, deal with climate change, the rising sea level. And that will indeed continue. So we were looking really uh, at, at the, the forecast of where people might live and locate uh, in the future relative to this climate change issue. Now, basically, just showing you quickly, the uh, this is the desktop version. This is London, the Greater London Authority, uh, which is the inner part of London to some extent. This is the 8 million people as opposed to the 15 million who are in the outer met area around Greater London. And the little red dot there is Heathrow Airport, if you've ever been to London. Uh, and that's about 15 miles from uh, the edge of, uh, by Heathrow to, uh, to the centre from there, basically. So that's Heathrow Airport. Uh, this model is built with different, uh, uh, different networks. We have a road network, a bus network, a heavy rail and a light net rail network. So we have four modes, basically. So there is a choice in a sense, and that's important in terms of scenarios. Uh, and you can see 38% of people travel by road, car, that is, 12% by bus, 12% by heavy rail, and uh, light rail, which is basically tube, and Docklands Light Railway is 19%. Um, okay, and these are the kind of pictures that we get. That These are models which are uh, I wouldn't say widely used, but there are plenty of them around basically now. Um, and this is uh, the, this is the interface showing you uh, some of the things. Now, I think that um, actually I've just, uh, you're probably seeing this, actually I've just loaded a movie basically at the back of this that uh, you can actually see that, um, and, and we've interfaced it with Google Earth basically. Um, and so this illustrates a different thing about how we can add software together and so on uh, in that sense. So this is this is Greater London uh, and we're, we're, we're using Google Earth to 
uh, put it into 3D basically, um, and uh, zooming in a bit. So uh, the red represents population density, uh, the blue histogram bars represent employment. We've scanned over that basically. Um, and this is showing you, I think, house prices. This is simply demonstrating uh, the idea that we can actually uh, we can actually um, develop these sort of things in a form that people can actually begin to uh, play around with, you know, on the desktop, basically. So let me move on, uh, basically, in a sense. Uh, we've looked at this to look at different scenarios. One of the big scenarios in London is the... Uh, uh, is the new Crossrail line basically? Uh, that's one bit of Crossrail from Heathrow to uh, uh, into the centre. We've built this new underground railway called the Elizabeth Line, which runs east to west, and it's made an enormous footprint on Britain. Basically, sort of the whole of the south is conditioned by this new tube line in some senses, and that's the kind of what-if scenarios that you can do with these sorts of models, basically. Um, okay, so. Uh, and uh, again, we've, we, we can develop them very quickly. Uh, this is for Dubai. We took a lot of the data just off the web for Dubai, basically, built it in a, you know, a couple of afternoons, basically, in that sense. Um, and here was the, the Dubai model. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, you can see that um, uh, these are the flows. What we did is um, we located a new center uh, in Dubai to, to illustrate this to people in Dubai about how you could think about, you know, thinking about forecasting uh, in terms of the city. Uh, so we introduced a new center at that point uh, where you can see the spike uh, and then looked at the implications of where people lived, where they worked and so on uh, in terms of the model. OK, so that gives you an idea of um, uh, of these models in some sense and, and the way we would take many of these ideas in complexity theory uh, and begin to fashion them into workable tools for planners in that sense, in the kind of what-if scenarios. Okay, let me uh, try and sum up just in, in, a, in a couple of thoughts. Um, and let me also return to Jane Jacobs in a 1961 book, The Life and Death uh, of American Cities. One of the the amazing things about her book was that uh, she'd read Warren Weaver's paper in 1948 about science and complexity. Um, and much of her book is really about thinking of the city as being a highly diverse, chaotic, robust, interesting kind of place, which was being destroyed by the sort of machine architecture of the contemporary movement of the modern movement in this thing. She was thinking of cities as being self-organizing systems that evolve not top down, etc., but really do evolve from the bottom up. And there's a number of quotes from her book. She says, cities happen to be problems in organized complexity like the life sciences. They present situations in which half a dozen or even several dozen quantities are all varying simultaneously in a subtly in connected, uh, interconnected ways. Uh, and then she says, why have cities not long since been identified and understood and treated as problems of organized complexity? If the people concerned with the life sciences were able to identify their difficult problems as problems of organized complexity, then why have people professionally concerned with cities not identifying the kind of problem that they have? Uh, and of course, one of the hallmarks of complexity in cities is the action uh, and evolution from the bottom up as millions and millions of little decisions which are not coordinated but they're not random either uh, they're not coordinated in any way but they they lead to these patterns that we see uh, the emergence in some sense the structures and so on uh, in terms of networks um, uh, and cities of different sizes and districts of different sizes uh, that we've illustrated here OK, so um, complexity theory informs us of the need to intervene at key pressure points. That's one thing. Uh, the whole idea is as we learn more about cities, we intervene within them less. Uh, the history of, uh, of modern planning in, in many cities, as Jane Jacobs said, has been fairly disastrous in a sense, without much understanding of how complex and sensitive cities are in a sense. Miss van der Rohe, the architect, said less is more. In that sense, Phil Anderson, the Nobel Prize winner, who was very involved in the Santa Fe Institute, says more is different, basically. These are cliches in a sense. Uh, in cities, 
what we see is not what we get as physical forms in it. We need to, 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 to peel these things back. And so to some extent, less is more should be the new mantra for planning. Uh, the idea being that we intervene less. And that's a very attractive notion. As we learn more, we intervene less in this particular context. So uh, conclusions then, we need to disentangle the wood from the trees in terms of scaling. We need much, much better substantive theory. In some sense, this is almost like a, a set of challenges for how we uh, develop a better science of cities and a better uh, way of actually using that science in terms of planning. We need better theory per se, much stronger requirements for validation, parsimony and so on. We need a stronger sense of how bottom-up thinking can be embedded in top-down control and planning, and we need many more applications. Okay, thank you very much for listening. You can get the PDF um, from this uh, this link if you need to. Um, and um, this is a picture of some of the books that I've written uh, relating to this sort of thing, starting with the uh, Cities and Complexity book, The New Science of Cities, Inventive Future Cities, these are all MIT Press. And then the book, which is um, the edited book online on urban informatics, um, a very easy and quick way to see what we do in our groups uh, and, and, and the whole domain really is to log on to that book because it's a Springer book that you can download free. Um, it's open access in that sense. And at that point, um, uh, host, I will hand back to you. Uh, I'm going to stop the sharing and uh, hand back to yourself. And um, if you want to ask any questions, then Please do. I don't know what the timing is like. Thanks a lot, Professor Betty. Uh, so first, I would like uh, this was such a insightful session, uh, uh, particularly for me. Uh, and uh, I have my own questions. But first, I would like to uh, invite our panel members if they have any questions or comments on on the talk. And thereafter, uh, the floor will be open to. Uh, uh, to our participants, our attendees, you just raise push, raise hand on your screen, and then I will unmute unmute you. Yeah, Professor, yeah. please go ahead. That was a. Can you hear me? I'm using different uh, headphones. Yeah. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for for providing uh, this kind of an eagle's eye view, if I may say so. Um, one thought that comes to mind is the way the way you drew the picture uh, of how cities are, how cities evolve, and so on. That's based upon, uh, if I may say, it's a it's a function of the set of human intents. But going into the future, it seems to me that cities need to perhaps pay more attention to the set of issues tied to planet friendliness. And the two may not necessarily meet halfway. So what are your thoughts, if I may ask, on how to bring that part of it in? Because although, although you did mention it, because when you, when you talked about the, the Cambridge model and the Lutty model and so on, you touched upon that. But I'm just curious. How how can one make make uh, the planet friend, friendliness aspect a centerpiece uh, of thinking about about future, which would end up necessarily being somewhat planned cities? So th that's one yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, um, I think that um, there really hasn't been very much thinking about how our modern planning systems, which are inevitably top down. I mean most of our government systems tend to be top down. There's not really been much thinking about how those systems uh, really relate to um, the system they're trying to change, which is developing from the bottom up in some sense. So, so, so in other words, um, in a sense, we need to renew our planning systems in some sense. Um, and that is a very difficult quest that um, one of the reasons why I think our planning systems are uh, our planning systems are increasingly out of date 
is is because of this that people are recognizing that the kind of complexity there is in the real world is not really handleable by these systems in a sense so uh, and, and of course one of the issues is 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 human behavior our human behaviors are also changing at the same time so it's not just that our planning systems are problematic because of the fact that uh, uh, top down planning is problematic uh, in that sense it's also because um, the systems they're dealing with the behavior that we have you know as as cities evolve they get more complex and that is due to the fact that um, there are many many more opportunities for interacting in cities than there were a hundred years ago basically in a sense and that's probably going to increase uh, continue to increase in that sense and so there's a whole range of things which are which are contradictory and problematic that need to be resolved in this particular context um, and we're only really just at the beginning of thinking about what they are I mean the other thing I've not talked about is that um, there are many many different views held by people who uh, study cities about the best way we should study cities not just the best way we should study cities what is important in cities to be st studied in that sense so the whole field of urban studies for example i mean what i talked about today would be regarded as being a relatively small part of what we know about cities in some sense um and how we begin to put all of this uh this knowledge together and use it effectively is very problematic there's no question about it um uh, in that sense and then of course um and this relates uh, very much i think to to india and other parts of the world other than uh, than uh, uh, my own country uh, that um uh that there are different cultural mores there are different cultural constraints which determine what society feels are important in this sense and then there are probably different um uh, different behaviors that lead to different different sorts of patterns and so on uh, in different cities in that context so the the it, it that what i talked about was complexity city as seen through the eyes of somebody looking at british cities um were i to try and do the same for american cities there may be there may be some quite big differences um not pro not as profound as what one might find in in terms of china for example which have a very different view about top-down planning i think from from britain a different sort of planning in that sense um uh and, and so um we're confronted with a great morass really of 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 contradictory systems really that we have to try and resolve in that way uh, and uh, one of the biggest problems i think with british cities is that we we have very inert and old-fashioned systems for dealing with uh, some of these kind of key problems basically Thanks a lot, Professor Betty. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Chaudhary, uh, you may please. Yeah. Uh, see, actually, uh, in your talk, you said that a city is characterized by individual people taking their individual decisions. And hence, that gives rise to the fractal behavior, the self-similar structure at multiple, strict, uh, multiple scales. Because, and that, that's the basis of the fractal nature of the city's organization and city's growth. Now, we said... Oh, you're frozen. Uh... Shantanu, you're... Uh, you're... What about that? In terms of cities, what kind of such equilibrium can at all come? Or if it will come, how? I missed that. Can you uh, can you repeat? I'm sorry that uh, yeah. there was a break. In between, yeah. there was some. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just repeating it here. So, say for example, you said that in your talk, you said that the, a city transformation in city is guided by an individual taking its individual decisions. Mm 
which is absolutely fundamental and that really gets modeled by the complexity theory and the fractal as a fractal as a phenomenon. My point is that as, as it evolves, as a fractal evolves, uh, there can be also certain self-limiting conditions set in and that actually can actually put a stop to this kind of organic growth. Mm. Okay, so there are various phenomena where we have seen such a thing happening. So now, uh, in terms of city, what do you think about it? Will there be any a limiting condition where the fractal converges, and hence that's a that's kind of a, a kind of a, a optimal final destination of the form of the city? Yes, I mean that's a very good point. The um, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think that. Um, uh, first of all, I think that um, you know the fractal analogy really is 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 limited in terms of scales, basically in that sense. So um, I don't think pe people have found it harder to deal with uh, fractal behaviors at the micro scale uh, in terms of local design, um, uh, whereas you begin to see uh, the emergence of these patterns over a relatively small range of scales really in that sense i mean one of the things i'm sure you know in fractals is that um fractal behavior often is constrained over a limited number of scales in that sense and this is certainly true of cities basically um in this context the other feature of course is that um although um uh, fractal patterns are generated by uh, individual si uh, decisions really from the bottom up. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, the world is not uh, completely sort of bottom up in sense that there, there are all, we do still have planning and we have planning at different scales, different types of planning at different scales. So although, although I said, well, you know, gave the impression the vast majority of what we see out there in terms of cities is not planned. Uh, there still is planning and planning at different scales. And at one level, um, uh, some of the planning that takes place is, is, is planning by individuals who are, who are powerful and make a bigger impact. The, the uh, individuals make differential impacts in terms of their, their impact on the city. So it's more complicated than the impression I gave in the sense that there is planning um, we haven't got a detailed catalog of of what these different planning decisions are. We know what central and local government planning is all about, etc. That's enshrined in our legislation. But there's lots of other planning by companies and agencies and so on uh, that take place that we could rewrite the whole of uh, the city in terms of different scales of planning, etc. In a way, and none of that's been done. So to to elaborate the the idea of the fractal model. We do need to look at these, these these other aspects of the limits to, you know, the fractal analogy in that sense. Uh, in terms of scale, um, then um, uh, we don't really have a clear view of what what's happening when cities begin to merge. Only in relatively recent years, probably in the last 50 years, have, have big cities begun to merge with 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 other cities basically so you're seeing that in um well i'm sure you're seeing it in uh, uh in in india but the 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 area i know best is the hong kong guangzhou macau area which where you've got um had enormous growth of course in hong kong but then the biggest area now uh, in guangzhou there's something in the order of 66 million people in that region and cities are beginning to fuse together uh, and we don't have good models of what that means because most of our models of cities are still still based on the notion that there is a strong central core, uh, which is historically inert uh, in, in a sense. So there are changes of that sort, really, and that may um, uh, that may have implications. I'm sure it will have implications for the fractal model, basically, in that sense. So at the very biggest scales of cities, and certainly at the smallest, the fractal model is not well worked out. It's, it's probably, it might even be said to break down, but we, we just don't know.
Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank, Thank you, Professor Betty. So, Professor Madera, you may please ask your question. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, my question is that, you know, there are very rapid technological advancements that is happening across the world, uh, maybe in terms of transportation, communication, and many other areas. How do we account for in the, you know, uh, modeling of uh, or planning of the things? Yeah, I mean, um... The technological developments are very rapid and they're leading to changes in behavior, I think, which are absolutely central to the way cities are organized in some sense. That we can already see that in terms of um, if you go back, well, when I was a young man, for example, the dominant transportation movements in British cities were based on the journey to work. If you now look at the dominant transportation movements, they're not they're not related to work particularly. Work is still significant, of course, uh, but there's lots of other movements which have taken place, which is due to increases in mobility. So, um, and of course, the the way people travel and so on is changing very ra radically. Um, at the moment, for example, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, there is a drop in um, in car travel quite substantial uh, in that sense, an increase in active travel, walking and so on. Um, uh, so that, and, and nobody really anticipated these changes. I mean, um, uh, in some sense, there will be changes, I think, with uh, the development of autonomous vehicles and certainly um, uh, vehicles that have a degree of autonomy anyway, uh, to some extent. Uh, in that sense. So, uh, and these are fairly obvious uh, issues in terms of uh, changes in technology. Uh, there will be uh, changes in, in, um, in locational, in location too, I think, through, um, uh, uh, through the, yeah, through, 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 through the development of, um, well, changes in location through the development of new energy systems and things of that sort. So I think there are some quite substantial issues related to technologies. And I, I go as far as to say that, yes, that, that um, we really don't know what the future holds with respect to some of these sorts of technologies in that context, um, particularly as the world is becoming rapidly digital in all almost every dimension really in that particular context uh, and so we, and, and and a lot of that future is just hidden from us it always has been hidden basically that uh, at every stage of the technological revolution we've never really been able to predict what happens next in that sense so that's very important when it comes to cities thank you thank you so much thanks a lot professor so uh, next uh, will be uh... Professor Mitali Mukherjee, Head of Biosciences and Bioengineering. I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead, ma'am. Quick lecture. So I come from the biological systems uh, study. So I wanted to ask uh, uh, two questions. One of the questions, of course, Professor Chaudhary alluded to is the carrying capacity, as we call in the ecosystem, that uh, an ecosystem has a particular carrying capacity beyond which the ecosystem would not stabilize. So in that vein, I wanted to ask you in your uh, model of cities, how important is the ecology as in the local ecologies, yeah. which is even going to be more important as the there is so much anthropogenic activity, which is disrupting the ecology, local ecological webs. So do you think that would be an important uh, consideration in uh, planning of cities? And a second question, if I may, yeah. uh, is that can cities, the kind of understanding you have of the cities, can it be used to understand complex diseases? Just like human uh, networks or whatever biological networks have inspired city planning or city designs, uh, the the network is very complex for medicine. It They, mm -hmm. they are because uh, there is too much redundancy in the system. So can we actually use the models of cities to understand human diseases the other way around? So these are two questions. Yeah, okay. So um, can you remind me of the first question again? The, the, the ecology, the, oh, yeah, the ecology, whole of yeah. local ecology. Yeah. 
one, one of the big one of the big problems i think one of the great challenges is to know how what we know about ecology um at all scales but uh, in particular in our context here we're talking about the city how that kind of how that kind of ecological balance really in some sense the ecological dynamics really relates to the human dynamics in a sense uh, in other words um uh, a lot of the science that really relates to what i was talking about is very much from the perspective of the human being the individual the household the family this kind of thing uh, whereas ecological systems are much harder to link to uh, the human dimension and to produce an integrated planning of the city uh, we need to have regard to how that relates to other systems it's not just ecology energy is also very problematic many of these things really relate to representation the the, the ecological systems the the human systems the transportation systems the energy systems have different different modes of representation um, and it makes it very difficult to integrate them in that sense so i think we 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 have an enormous challenge involved in trying to integrate these different aspects of the city when i talk about the science of the city i'm only talking about the science from a very specific point of view really i'm not talking about building science particularly I'm not talking about the eco ecological science and that sort of thing. Um, in some senses, it, and, and so what I'm really saying is that that in terms of the ecological dimension, it's incredibly important, uh, but it's very difficult to deal with in some senses. It's easy to deal. It, it's easy to see how you can deal with it, you know, in a very narrow parochial sense, but the implications uh, on other other systems in the city are not well worked out at all and vice versa so that was the first point the second point was uh can you again sorry can you remind me again of the second so, uh, the so i just uh, said that just like uh, ecologic meaning the biological sciences have inspired a lot of things in the city understanding yeah. can the this understanding of cities be used to understand diseases the other way well to some extent to some extent the answer is 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 probably yes but but, but in terms of what is being done uh, in a sense then um obviously the the, uh, the the recent pandemic has been quite instrumental in in pushing people who uh, in my area who think about cities to think about the implications of the pandemic many of those involve network effects uh, in the sense that um, but they don't only involve network effects they involve uh, questions of um, uh, the questions of well they are network effects I suppose but questions of the family so uh, some of some of some of the big issues related to the spread of the disease really relate to some of the human factors that pertain to um you know uh, segregation to ethnicity to uh, income uh, resources uh, uh, links to healthcare and so on so in that context um there's a big job to be done on thinking about how those sorts of networks really relate to the transmission of disease i've often wondered for example uh, about the transmission of uh, diseases that we have under control, such as influenza and so on. Uh, and um, uh, we have very little understanding of what it means to uh, for an influenza epidemic and uh, people traveling around in cities on, on subways and this kind of thing. Um, I don't think we just ha have, have much. We have individual studies that have looked at different aspects, but we don't have any comprehensive way of doing it. But in fact, the networks involved, the many, many networks that we have, are absolutely key, I think, to you know, understanding the transmission of these diseases and indeed then, of course, the control of them in this particular context, mitigation of them in that sense. So, so your, your question is very well taken. And again, it's one of these things, it's like the ecology question, we don't really have much, uh, much um, uh, idea about how to do these things, notwithstanding the fact that we're important, but at least we're beginning to recognize, you know, 
30 or 40 years ago, people didn't even recognize these things, basically. So that's kind of one of the uh, one of the, the positive points in this sense, that uh, there are people beginning to think about these things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Betty. So uh, Dr. Prabhat had also raised his hand earlier. Dr. Prabhat, would you like to ask a question now? Yes, am I audible? Yes, you are. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Professor. It was really an exciting talk and very enriching indeed. Uh, the question is, whenever I see a pattern in space and time, I get tempted to find out the length scale hidden inside through the tools of correlation function. So how do I calculate for such a vast parameter space in these networks that you talked about for the cities? How do we calculate correlation functions? Yeah, and how do I get the length scale, let's say, for these associated Length, uh, the, and the pattern that you showed in various well, slides. Well, a, a lot of the a lot of the work that's been done uh, with looking at fractal properties of urban form and so on, uh, I've used fairly standard methods of um, uh, extracting, um, you know, fractal dimensions and so on, box counting, things of that sort, basically. I I personally am not an expert on, um, on 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 knowing the the intricacies of these things. Basically, I mean, there's been some work done on um, uh, there's been some work done on um, multifractals, etc. Uh, in in a, in a, in an urban context, but it's it's not really very, you know, well, well it's well defined, but it's not it's not really very meaningful in some sense that. Um, uh, the, this is this is in answer, I think, to the director's question about the limits to fractals, basically, in that sense. Uh, I'm not quite sure I'm answering your question in that sense. No, I, I got some idea, but I was a little bit confused with the term like P, you know, population with having P square interactions. So oh, the yeah. moment I see interactions, I thought maybe there is a possibility of trying to calculate correlations among these. Well, I mean, you, the work the, the work on um, interactions in populations, basically, um, is fairly straightforward. It, 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 this is the work that the Santa Fe group have really been doing, which is really related to the fact that um, as uh, cities grow in size, and of course, we've not really talked about the boundary effects on cities. That's a very important issue that uh, that really comes up, you know, uh, in, in defining a city by size, we need to draw a boundary in some sense. And of course, the boundaries are often very blurred uh, in that sense. But nevertheless, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of city size, uh, then um, the the general conclusion, I think, from work which has been done over the last 10 years is that as cities grow in size, they certain quantities grow more than proportionately, other quantities grow less than proportionately. So, in other words, income grows more than proportionately. In that sense, bigger cities have more uh, richer people than smaller cities, basically. But at the same time, bigger cities might also have more poor people uh, than than than. Um, uh, than smaller cities too. And the rich tend to outweigh the poor in that sense. So it looks as though as cities grow, they're getting richer in that sense. Now, the, the, those sorts of ideas are quite important in terms of uh, thinking about the policy for locating things in cities uh, in that sense. So um, in some sense, this whole question of scaling uh, in terms of city growth it's quite a hot topic, really, at the moment, largely because the assumption is that the, the bigger the city, uh, the more likely you are to be able to um, generate uh, some advantage, basically, uh, in this particular context. And a lot of that really relates to um, ideas that come out of allometry in this sense, uh, with changes in the, uh, the quality of changes in the size of uh, animal and plant populations, really. Um, as they grow and change. Thank you, Professor. Can I ask just one more question? Is it go possible? On. Yep, go on. Uh, 
let's say a city evolves because of let's say being declared at you know some educational hub or institutional hub some or financial hub okay then the fractal structure that we saw in these patterns they might percolate right and the fractality may be lost let's say these are more and more connected yeah so some kind of percolation can happen right yeah is there any way we can quantify those things which can disrupt these structures? Well, we've done some work on percolation uh, where we've taken very large networks across the whole country uh, and begun to um, collapse the networks uh, so that we can actually define uh, different physical clusters, sizes of clusters and so on. Um, is that what you're thinking of in particular? I mean, we've not really we've been using percolation to figure out different sizes of cluster for different sizes of city basically in that sense um um was that what you had in mind when you talked about percolation no i thought maybe now these different isolated structure will become more and more connected as a function of time oh i and see okay yeah and they will yeah, percolate that... over the whole yeah Yes, I mean, there's no question about it that, that um, in many senses, yes, uh, uh, these structures do appear to be becoming more connected. Now, there may be some, some structures in cities that are becoming less connected as, as we've got changes in technology um, in that context. But certainly, uh, in, we tend to live in an era of growth of cities still, uh, and certainly pe people moving into cities, even when, uh, if, for example, growth came to an end and we had a relatively stable world population, I still think we'd have very big changes taking place in terms of networks within cities that, to some extent, networks, networks represent opportunities for interaction. And these are growing all the time as new technologies come in that enable us to link with people, you know, as we get more wealthy and have more time to link and so on. So, so I think, yes, <coughs> I can't point to any studies about where, <coughs> excuse me, networks have increased uh, in that context, but I'm pretty sure that you're right in the sense that as cities grow, <coughs> some of them, their networks are intensifying. And new networks are take, new networks are emerging on top, uh, and, and in relation to the the networks that are already there. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Professor Betty. So now we have uh, we have a question from our head of civil and infrastructure engineering, uh, Dr. Ranju Mohan. So I'm just unmuting her. Give me a second. Yeah, Dr. Raju, you may go ahead, please. Hello, Professor Betty. Very good evening from here. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is from a future city transportation vision perspective, if you follow a top down approach with unrestricted vision at the top, and for step by step planning of transportation, if we choose a bottom top approach, what all are could be the intervening key pressure points? on the meeting platform of both these approaches. Can you repeat, can you repeat it again, basically? Uh, top yeah. down. So uh, now if we are uh, on a mission of future city transportation, yeah. future vision, I, I need to have a vision for after 10 years or 15 years, how a city transportation would be. So to have an unrestricted vision, without any restriction, if I need to think, I need to have a top bottom approach. However, uh, can in conventional approaches, every, every time we are following bottom top approach in transportation planning, as you mentioned now, today, first we will see the historical data, the population data, employment data, and all these things. Uh, so if, we, if I need to go for a step-by-step -step planning of transportation, I may prefer to choose a bottom top approach. But if I need to have an unrestricted vision for future transportation, I need to go for a top bottom approach. That's a system approach you are telling. So yeah. they, if I'm thinking on both this way, there will be some uh, platform where my both approaches will meet. 
and there will be some key pressure points which intervene many of my thoughts. What 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 dollar can be these pressure points? Okay, um, yeah, I, I take your point that that um, in some senses, uh, in thinking about future transport, the visions for future transport, um, uh, you can think about, um, you know, a top-down approach to transport, which is the traditional, well, to some extent, the traditional way. Um, uh, but you can also think about changes from the bottom up, uh, in some sense, um, and how do these how do these link with one another in a way that um, you know a long term vision for transport clearly must include changes in behaviour uh, and also changes in technology uh, in some sense, uh, and of course uh, you can sketch out a vision for. Uh, a more efficient transport system or a more equitable transport system uh, from th that point from those that those points of view um uh, but also from the bottom up uh, you're beginning to see already i think certainly in british cities uh, a lot more people beginning to uh, change their mode of transport basically in that sense which is an individual bottom up decision it's being supported to some extent by uh, you know, local authorities and so on, um, uh, in a sense. So you have these two two elements, really, of top down and bottom up, and how do they connect in some sense? Well, um, I'm not sure I'm able to answer that in any way, but I mean, they do connect. There's no question about it. But I think it depends on, on the context. It depends on um, the agencies and the individuals involved in this sort of decision making basically in that sense there's no question that some of the things emerging from the bottom up um in terms of active travel for example are being picked up by agencies who work from the top down in that sense so there is a bit of an interchange between uh, new ways of travel at the bottom up um and the way uh, travel is being constituted from the top down and that's in the provision of so there's been a great growth in, for example, in British cities of people riding bikes. Uh, I wouldn't say great growth, but there's been a significant growth, basically. Um, and that's really been a bottom up type phenomenon from the top down. Um, uh, agencies, local authorities and so on, transport agencies have begun to provide facilities for this bottom up type behavior, really. So there is some sense uh, in which. Uh, the bottom up and the top down are beginning to link in terms of a transport planning process. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Betty. And uh, there are some more questions, but I'm very, very mindful of the time that you allocated to us. So uh, we already took your lunch hours, so we don't want to take <laughs> more. So, so now I would like to invite Professor Krishna for a word of thanks. And I encourage others who have remaining questions, you may please reach out to uh, CDFP or Professor Betty himself uh, and uh, let's uh, continue the conversation. But for now, over to Professor Krishna. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Betty, for that uh, fascinating uh, lecture. And I, uh, this looking at cities as a dynamic and a never ending equilibrium uh, was a very refreshing thought. Uh, and also uh, what was very encouraging was it's you mentioned about uh, development of the city being dominated by positive feedback. Usually we see we think it's negative, but the dominated by positive feedback was very encouraging to uh, listen to and and also uh, simulating urban growth uh, based on fractal geometry uh, is, I think, a very uh, interesting way to look at it. And certainly right from the questions we could find that uh, there were already people thinking about uh, uh, the city planning from those aspects. So, and I think the amount of questions shows the amount of interest uh, IIT Jodhpur fraternity has and how your talk has uh, really uh, encouraged them to think along those lines. So thank you so much for uh, being a, a big agent of uh, a new thought for us. Thank you so much. And I would also like to uh, take the opportunity to thank our director, uh, Professor Chantran Chaudhary, who has been the a guiding force for our for future of the cities uh, initiative, which we are working on, and uh, for all the other activities we are doing in uh, uh, in our institute, uh, and also Professor, our deputy director Professor Vadera for his uh, uh, forever support 
for the institute talks and encouraging and also this one for uh, helping us organize it. And not uh, last but not the least, I think uh, Professor uh, Surjit Sen, without whose contact this would not have been possible. So thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Sen. Uh, I think I, I also would like to acknowledge uh, a few people. Uh, of, of course, we have uh, Sri Anurag Goyal, uh, who is our uh, advisor and a very active participant of the Future of City Initiative, and he connects us. He's a he's from the Indian Administrative Service, and he connects us to a lot of planners. So. He's been very active uh, in our group. Uh, we are trying to see whether we can take some of these thoughts and have an influence of the uh, technology and the policy part, uh, especially in the future of the cities. Uh, a few of us, the team who really worked to put this together, uh, especially Dr. Devinjan Guharoy, who helped us with the uh, media uh, outreach, and uh, Dr. Bat Gaurav Bhatnagar, uh, and uh, also uh, staff from uh, the Center of Technology Foresight and Policy, Jitendra, and from the Computer Center, uh, Simanta Das, who have been holding forth to make sure there is no technical glitch. And I think, touch wood, this has been a very, very smooth overall. So thank you, uh, everyone, for that. And uh, we would like to invite you to our campus, Professor Batty, at the right time when you think you are, uh, uh, we would like to travel. We'd be very honored and glad to host you here. So thank you so much. Uh, for this lecture, and I thank all the participants uh, for their time. Uh, I know it went past it went past uh, our planned time, but I think it was very enriching. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Chowdhury. Would like to add something. Thank you. Thanks, Professor, Bit, Bit, for the for your time, and we look forward to welcome you in the campus. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Everybody, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye.